Hi, Katie, is it? Hello? Hello, yes. Hi, <laughs> great. Um, can you hear and see me okay? I guess you can. <laughs> yep. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so thanks very much for taking the time to come and see us today. Um, my name's Harriet um, and I'm a Director of Studies for Biological and Natural Sciences at Sydney Sussex College. Look at the mouthful. Um, there's another um, fellow, Sarah Millington Burgess, on the call. Her camera's turned off at the moment, but she will ask you some questions after I, we're done. And um, so we just have to start off with some procedural stuff, which is a bit boring um, for which I apologise. But um, so before we get going, can you confirm there's no one else in the room with you and that you've turned all your other devices off? Yes. Perfect. So the interview is going to last around 25 minutes and um, the main part will be the academic section of the interview and then at the end there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions if you have any it's fine if you don't um, and so what we're going to be doing is we're going to ask you questions that are related to the work that you will have done in biology at school so you may not be familiar with everything we talk about that's completely normal we're just going to discuss problems with you and see how you think and um, so if at any point something's not clear or you want something repeating just ask um, and equally, it's really great to think out loud and then we can see, follow your train of thought. If you don't get know how to get to an answer, don't worry, we'll get there together. It's not a problem. And we may also move on to other things for reasons of time. That doesn't necessarily mean you're not doing well. It just it is uh, because of the time pressure. So don't be put off by that. So obviously, these are slightly strange interview circumstances so if at any point we lose the connection don't panic we'll try and resolve that um, and if we encounter any kind of severe technical difficulties like we lose connection completely um, then we might have to end the interview and reschedule it but either way you won't be disadvantaged by the technical issues so don't worry about that and then finally, I just have to say to remind you that you're not permitted to make a record of any part of this interview so that's it is all of that clear yes perfect indeed. okay um so um i just thought i'd uh, start with a question about your personal statement um it's great that you're so interested in in um biology and biochemistry i understand you're quite interested in the miller and euler experiments i wondered if you could expand a little bit on that yeah i was quite interested in how the first cells came about and what was required for these first cells to work so i looked into the different types of origins of life theories. So there's the panspermia, which I don't think is very popular at all. It is um, a controversial area, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, and, um, and there's also the RNA world and the DNA world. And this Miller and Urey experiment was basically they they pumped a spark through some steam and they made it go round and round in this lollipop of condensation and evaporation and eventually they created quite a lot of amino acids and glycine which is the most simple one but lots of other complex molecules and pathways and I thought it was really interesting that they could do that from just a bit of sparking and it sort of confirmed at the time I think Darwin's theory of the warm pond <laughs> so I, I liked that and how it all sort of linked together and then obviously lots of that's been discounted now as you know incorrect gases in the atmosphere and things like that not really reflecting Hadean um, gases at all but now there's much more complicated and interesting theories surrounding other ways that molecules can be formed. Yeah it's really really interesting my, my friend works for NASA and he looks at what amino acids are on um, asteroids and things like that it's uh, kind of really really interesting. Um, well, that's great. That sounds like you found something really interesting to think about. Um, so we're going to kind of think about um, those basic cell units um, today. So I'm just going to um, share my screen with you. Hopefully this will be um, OK if it can find it. Oh, no, I may have closed it. Hang on. Let me open it up again. Sorry for the slight delay. Okay, so let me try that again. Hmm. All right, so you should be able to see an image now. I'm just going to make this bigger so it's easier to see. And um, so we're just going to talk about what this is really and what if you recognize anything about it um 
so I guess starting from the kind of basic uh, is it do you have any idea what we're looking at at all uh, it looks like a eukaryotic cell the cytoplasm the things in that oh great so what what made you think you're, you're correct so what sort of what made you think about that um, just because there's lots of things with a membranes, so mm -hmm. these subcellular membranes are indicative of a eukaryotic cell over a prokaryotic cell. And there's lots of different um, structures within this picture. So you can see that it's not just one part of the cell, it's multiple different parts. And the cytoplasm has lots of different small things in it. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, so we'll come back to what some of those little things are in a second. And um, I don't suppose you have, uh, I, if I don't know if you've seen anything that looks like this before, but do you have any idea how we might create these sorts of images? Um, probably with an electron microscope. Mm, yeah. What, but what, it, sorry, carry on. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say it looks it looks quite two dimensional. So I would say probably um, the the T M. Mm, yes, it is indeed. So what? Why? what's the advantage of using an electron microscope over uh, the other kind of more common light microscope for these sorts of experiments? Um, the resolution is a lot higher, so you can get um, a better picture of really small objects. And um, I think that's probably the main advantage. You can just magnify a lot more to a high degree of accuracy and quality and things like that. Mm, absolutely. So we get to see inside cells, which is quite exciting. Um, so, yeah, so this, as you say, is taken from a transmission electron microscope. Uh, it's a TA, TEM image. Um, so you said we, you can see lots of kind of membrane bound organelles here, and you're quite right. Um, do you know any that you'd expect to see inside a cell or and can you? So I hopefully you can see my cursor. So we've yeah. got some kind of squiggly bits here we've got some more um sort of cylindrical round cylindrical things here some circles a big one big circle down here um any ideas what any of these things might be um the cylindrical ones you pointed out with the lines in uh-huh they could be mitochondria mm -hmm. right? yeah yeah they are indeed um and these squiggly lines that mm -hmm. looks like maybe it's the endoplasmic reticulum but I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, yeah. So it probably is. Um, any other candidates for for the squiggly lines? Uh, there's quite a few kind of patches of it, I guess. Um, could they be sort of the filaments in the cell that cause movement and things like that, like actin and myosin? Or um, so potentially, what what sort of cells might you be thinking about? If, uh, so I guess seeing actual actin and, and myosin, what sort of cell might you be thinking about there? Muscle cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so potentially, um, uh, so I think in this case, it's probably at your first guess, the um, endoplasmic reticulum could maybe be Golgi as well. Um, so, yeah. OK, so you said that these ones are mitochondria. There's some yeah. things that look kind of quite similar, but they're like circles rather than your more classic textbook kind of fat sausage situation. Um, what do you think they might be? Um, maybe chloroplast. OK, yeah. And so what sort of cell would it be if it was a chloroplast? It'd be a plant cell. Mm, yeah, indeed, indeed. So, um, yeah, we can't really tell with the information in here um, because it's quite, it's only a sort of section of the cell. And um, what other things might you expect to see in a plant cell, but not in an animal cell? Uh, maybe some transport such as xylem and phy phylum, phylum, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, phloem, yeah, perhaps. Um, oh. So um, any, any other kind of subcellular um things that you have in plant cells versus animal cells maybe oh, vacuole yeah vacuole indeed indeed so that would be a clue if we had a bigger picture but um we've only got this little section um okay um so there's another i'm going to tell you that some of these circular ones it is in fact an animal cell so we're not going to see chloroplasts in this case um any other idea of why we might be seeing some circular things that look very similar to the sausage ones but the circular any reason you might see that 
Um, that's probably just because they're rotated in the cell. So with the particular angle of the microscope, you're looking at a different way. You're looking down instead of along. Absolutely, yeah. Really important to think about how the, these images are made. So as you said, they're kind of sliced through the cell, so we're only going to see what's in that slice. Perfect. Um, how about this uh, big thing down here? Any ideas? Uh, probably the nucleus. Yeah, quite possibly, uh, especially since you know it's an animal cell. Um, indeed. Um, so arguably, I mean, I haven't really given you a kind of control cell to compare, but um, I'm going to say that there's quite a few mitochondria in this cell. Can you think of any cells that might require a high number of mitochondria based on what you know about them? Any cell that uses a lot of energy. So a muscle cell would probably require a lot of mitochondria, but then other cells that do a lot of breaking down and catabolism or anabolism. Mm. Um, probably require lots of mitochondria so maybe a, a neuron that makes um, vesicles with neurotransmitter in and, and then breaks them down and makes them up again would require lots of those. Absolutely yeah so um, anything that's as you say doing lots of things and synthesis as you say in transport are really really expensive things to be doing in terms of energy. Um, so this is in fact a, a liver cell, um, but for similar reasons, it's very energy requiring. Um, do you know anything about why liver cells might need lots of energy? Liver cells take up nutrients from, well, from, from liver cells. Um, they might need energy for transporting things across the membranes. Absolutely. Like sugar and amino acids. Great. Yeah. So they yeah, they um, are involved in lots of kind of digestion and, and enzyme production. So, yes, absolutely. Good. Um, and so kind of linking, circling back a bit to what you were talking about before, um, mitochondria have been linked to this kind of early life argument. Um, have you come across that at all in what you've been um, looking at, sort of what mitochondria might have been in a past life so mitochondria have two membranes mm. which it's very hard to see in the picture i don't think yeah. you really <laughs> see it as well. but um there's theories that these mitochondria were originally um their own sort of almost bacteria like organism and they were engulfed by phagocytosis by another organism and that's what could have made it um eukaryotic in the end but it's this double this double membrane is because of the phagocytosis. So the other membrane would have been the vesicle that it was used to take it in. Absolutely, is this idea of the kind of endosymbiotic theory. Great. OK, I'm afraid we've run out of time now. So um, I'm going to pass over to Sarah, who's going to ask you some questions. But thank you very much. OK, thank you.